Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's the message from one of the pastors here at The Rock. Let's do this. Let's get into the Word of God because you know what? Listen, you don't come to hear from a man. I know it's Easter Sunday. I know that, but you don't come to hear from a man. You don't come to hear from the old or the young or the black, the white, the brown or anything like that. Listen, we always come into church to hear from God. So I'm going to get down on my knees. I'm going to go before the Lord in prayer. If you're able to stand, would you join me and let's stand together and let's go before the Lord and prepare our hearts to receive the Word of the Lord. Father, we come before you, and Lord, we're just so grateful for the opportunity that we have to be here in the house of the Lord. God, we don't come to church today, even though it's Easter out of tradition. Lord, we don't come to hear from a man. God, we don't come to church uh, for entertainment's sake, but truly we come into this place to hear from you. And we fully acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the senior leader of this church. So God, it's in the name of Jesus we ask your Holy Spirit would speak to us, would be our teacher, our counselor, our guidance today. Show us the word of God that you would teach us today, Lord, and plant the seed of the word in our hearts as we leave today, this Easter Resurrection Sunday, God, we would leave empowered, equipped, encouraged to get out there and to be who you have called us to be. And Lord, we thank you for all the blessings that you've given to us, your church. Lord, at no time do we see ourselves as better than anybody else, but rather we are co-laborers in the body of Christ, all working together to build your kingdom for your glory. So Father, we thank you that on this blessed day, on this holy day, Lord, that you set your hand upon all the churches across the world and around the Inland Empire that are preaching and celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for our Catholic brothers and sisters and all of our denominational, Baptist, Lutheran, Presbyterian, Episcopalian, Methodist brothers and sisters, Foursquare. Lord, we thank you for our local churches. I ask that you would bless Harvest and, and, and the Grove and Sandals and, and, and uh, the Well and the Way, Ecclesia, Father. I thank you for Inland, uh, I'm sorry, for Emmanuel Baptist and God for Crossroads, for Trinity, Lord, for Abundant Living, Lord, all the churches across the Inland Empire and around the world that are preaching and hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, we truly are brothers and sisters in building together the body of Christ, serving different purposes, but all to build your kingdom for your glory. So to you be the praise and the glory and the honor in Jesus' mighty name. And we all said, Amen. Amen. Well, praise God as you're taking your seats. Get ready for the word of the Lord. I'm encouraged for what God has. Let me give you a little bit of information about where we're going, what we're talking about. This is uh, Easter weekend. So what we're going to do is we're going to cover three central, theme, three central themes to the resurrection message. All right, we're going to talk about the death the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we're going to look at what those mean to you and I. What are the lessons? What are some of the things that we can pull out of and we can apply into our life so that as we walk out of this place, as we leave the walls of this auditorium and we go into life as we know it, we can understand what God has for us, what God wants to teach us, and what God wants to show us in our life so that we can become more and more like him and bring glory to the Father and show God. God, what a great God he is. So in these three themes, the death, the burial, and the resurrection, we're going to take those three themes and we're going to apply three simple words out of the word of God and what the word of God shows us out of these three themes. Starting today with the first of them all, the death of Jesus Christ. What is it that the death of Jesus Christ shows or reveals to you and I? Let me say it like this. If you're taking notes, his death shows love. The death of Jesus Christ shows love. Yes, the death of Jesus Christ brings redemption. It brings justification. It brings the cleansing of our sins. But the death of Jesus Christ exemplifies to you and I the love that God has for us, each and every one of us in this place and truly around the world. If you've got your Bibles, why don't you turn with me to the book of Romans. Go with me to the book of Romans in the fifth chapter. Paul the Apostle is writing to the church in Rome. Romans in the fifth chapter, what an amazing theme Paul is talking about to the church. And in Romans in the fifth chapter, verse number eight, Paul the Apostle has an amazing truth here. And it says that God demonstrates, that God demonstrates. Now, going back to verse number six, just quickly, the Bible says that Jesus Christ died for the ungodly. Not the godly, not the ones that followed God, not the ones that believed because, they, or that did not see but believed, but rather, for Christ died for the ungodly. Then it goes on in verse number 8 now to say that, that God demonstrates his love. He proves his love. He exemplifies his love. He shows his love to you and I. 
in that while we were still sinners. Listen, while we did not realize, while we were ignorant of who Jesus Christ is and what he did, nonetheless, Jesus died for us on that cross on Calvary's Hill 2,000 years ago so that we could be free. And in this message, we see the demonstration. We see the evidence and the proof of God's love for us. Let me take you somewhere. Just go with me for a moment, if you will. You don't have to turn there, but the very first verse in the Bible, Genesis, the first chapter, says, in the beginning, in the beginning, God created. Now, just, just go with me for a moment. Just, just, just expand your thinking. Let's, let's examine this for a moment. This is God that we're talking about, our, our, our creator God, our sovereign God, who is, who is so righteous, who is, who is so holy. There is none like God. There is none before and none after. God is the beginning and the end. He knows the beginning from the end. And here the Bible tells us that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This is a God that did not need to use his hands to create, to build, but rather would speak and planets would come into existence, would, would utter the very word and light came into being that God spoke and he hung the galaxies and the stars and he set the sun and the moon and he set the planets around the rotation of the sun and he set the earth at its right axis so that we his creation could live here on this earth and be comfortable this is the God that speaks and things exist. The God who sees the finite details of the infinite details of the universe and sees all the way down to the finite details of, of, of the, the, the small feather onto a hummingbird into the microorganisms that we have discovered through scientific discovery. This is the same God, God the creator. And he is so sovereign that you have to understand that God in no time needed to prove anything to us, his creation. But what God did is he loved us so much. He loved us so much that he demonstrated, that he proved, that he exemplified his love for us by giving for our sins Jesus Christ, his most valuable possession. You see, God didn't want to just give precious jewels or rubies or diamonds or anything like that so that we could be free of what we were born into, the sin nature of man, but rather God said, I love you so so much that I will give you what costs me the most, my only begotten son. I think of it like this in my beautiful wife. I married my high school sweetheart. I remember we were just talking about this last night. I remember the very first moment I saw my wife Stacy. We were, uh, we were in junior high or in high school and we were on our way to, to church camp and she was dating at the time one of my friends. Now I say at the time because shortly thereafter he wasn't my friend because she started dating me. And... <laughs> I was dating my wife, and now we were high school sweethearts. Now, there was a time when I moved away to Bible college in Oklahoma where we weren't able to, to court, but we developed a friendship. And I remember as I came back and we attended university together, there came a time in my life when I wanted to make a profession of my love for, for my for my. My, my girlfriend at the time, I wanted to let her know that I wanted to spend the rest of my life, that she would be the only woman in my life that I would love like that. So what did I do? I went down, I got in my car, and I went to that store where there's a bunch of glass displays and a guy in his suit behind that glass display. And as you know, inside of those gla in that glass display was, was all sorts of rings and diamonds and, and all the different jewelry. And I remember him taking me back to his private cubicle back in the back, and I signed my life away because I bought her a ring that I couldn't afford, so I had to get a loan to buy her the ring because I wanted her to know how valuable she was to me. I didn't want to just give her anything to tell her I loved her. I wanted her to understand that it cost me something. And we understand that in the loves of our life. But you see, God wants you and I to understand how much that he loves us, that he wanted to give. He had to give us something that would cost him. He had to show for us his love that would cost him something. And the Bible tells us that the gold that paves the streets of heaven is so pure that it's clear. So therefore, the riches of this world aren't enough for God to show his love. So he demonstrates it to you and I through giving Jesus Christ. St. Augustine said that God loves each and every one of us as if we are the only one. God loves each and all, God loves uh, each one of us as if there were only one of us. 
You've got to understand we have got to shed in our minds that we have to stop seeing God as this, uh, this deity on his almighty hill waiting to punish, waiting to discipline, waiting to scorn us for the bad decisions that we've made in our life, but rather God loved us so much that he sent Jesus Christ as a way for us to become free of our sin so that we could again be reunited and connected to him. The death shows us love. The Bible tells us in the book of 1 John, I'll throw it on the overheads for you if you don't have your Bibles, it's okay. The book of 1 John in the fourth chapter, verse number 9 in the New Living Translation, it says, God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. And verse number 10 goes along and says, this is real love. This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that God loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. The death on the cross that Jesus endured so that we could enjoy life is God's way of saying that he loves us. God proved his love for us on the cross when Christ bled, when he hung and he died. It was God saying to us, to the world, I love you. Jesus loved us so much, the Bible tells us, that Jesus knew his hour had come and he had loved us to the very end. In the, in the time that Jesus was sitting with his disciples right before his betrayal, he tells his disciples, there is no greater love than this, than a man to lay down his life for his friends. Praise God, Jesus didn't just tell us that statement and give us a divine instruction, but rather he says that statement and shortly thereafter that statement is made. Jesus exemplified for us the love that God has for us by hanging on that cross to die so you and I could live life in abundance, so that we could live life with freedom, so that we could live life and understand that we are loved and therefore we have love in our lives because God showed us how much he loved us. He proved it to us on that cross on Calvary through the death of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So good. In his death, it shows us the love. As we continue with the resurrection story, you'll find that not only did Jesus die there on the cross, but also he was buried. In fact, if you want to turn your Bible with me to the book of Matthew, first gospel there, first book of the New Testament, Matthew, and we're going to be in the 27th chapter, taking a look at two verses. Matthew chapter 27, verse number 59, and verse number 60. We're talking about the burial of our Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 27, verse 59 and 60. Let me set the stage for you. Jesus has died on the cross. Now they're going to take the body down. And a, and a godly man comes. In fact, he was a rich man. His name was Joseph. Came from a place called Arimathea. And there Joseph goes before Pilate him and a man by the name of Nicodemus, who we know was a Pharisee, one of the religious, religious leaders. And, and, and they go and they ask for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a godly man. He was looking for the kingdom of God, the Bible says. And, and, and as well, when they voted against Jesus, Joseph, being a part of the council, decided not to vote against Jesus, did not condemn Jesus to death with the other counselors there. And now here he is, and take a look at what happens in Matthew, the 27th chapter, verse number 59. He goes and he gets the body of Jesus. Matthew, chapter 27, verse number 59 says this, when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth. Now, Joseph, the Bible tells us, was a rich man. He was very wealthy. And so he purchased fine linen, linen that was fit for a king, and he wrapped the body of Jesus. And Nicodemus had brought spices and embalmed the body of Jesus as was their custom. Take a look at the next verse, verse number 60. And laid it, speaking of the body of Jesus, laid it in his new tomb. Everybody see up on the overheads how I highlighted that for you, in his new tomb. Okay, I want you to say that with me, in his new tomb. Oh, good job. You guys did better than the previous services. Laid it in his new tomb. Why is that important? Well, we're going to find out why that's important in a couple of minutes here. But look at what it says. When he had hewn out of the rock and he rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb and departed. You can imagine how the disciples felt after Jesus was taken by the Roman officials, beaten, scourged, mocked, crucified. Everything that they had hoped for, all that they thought that Jesus would do, they thought Jesus was going to set up his kingdom here on the earth, and yet here their king is crucified on a Roman cross. Here there's loss. Here there's death. They think that it's the end. Many times in our lives when we come to the death of something or to the end of something, 
we stop there. But I'm here to tell you that today that the burial doesn't show us the end. No, his burial calls for faith. Are you listening today? His burial calls for faith. See, we have a hard time. I don't know, maybe you don't, but I know I do at times. We have a hard time when we can't see things, when we can't calculate it out, when we don't understand, how is this going to work, God? I just, I don't see it in the natural. Situations can end. Sometimes things die in our life, and we wonder, God, what are you doing? What's going on? Why did this have to stop? And we quit right there when we don't see it any longer. Maybe the marriage ends. Husband or wife has walked out, and you say, that's it. It's over. I don't see how this can work. Children go south, and they're not communicating, not coming back. And you say, that's it. That, I, I guess this is how it's going to be. Maybe you get the pink slip on the job, and you say, hey, it's over. I don't know how I'm going to make it. You miss the payment. Now they've repossessed the house. They've taken back the car. All of it is gone. And you stop, and you say, God, I don't know what's going on. God, I can't see how this is going to work. And yet, the burial of Jesus lets us know that this is a time of faith. See, that hidden time is a testing time for our hearts to show us where we're at, to see, am I really believing God? Am I really in there in faith? Or, or am I going to stop here where this death is, where this end is? It's a testing time, and it's a waiting time. It's a time of faith. See, sometimes we can stop at those areas and we can cry and bawl and squall. God, I don't know what's going to happen. I and Lord, I just saw that. And, 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 and we bawl and we cry and we say, God, I don't know what's going on. And we end up like Mary. You remember Mary? There she is. The morning of the resurrection doesn't know what's happened yet. She's going there. And her and the ladies go and, and she sees that the, the stone has been rolled away and she's looking for Jesus. She's crying. And she, in fact, runs into Jesus, but she doesn't know who he is and she's crying. She thinks he's the gardener. And she says, well, tell me, where did you lay the body of Jesus? And he says, Mary, hello. You know, like, come on, it's me here. And then she realized who he is. See, sometimes in our life, if we get our eyes off of God, we'll stop at what we knew. We'll stop at the end. We'll stop at the death. And then when we run into God, we won't recognize what he's doing in our lives. Can you say amen? amen. See, Jesus had told the disciples this was going to happen. This is what boggles my mind, is that Jesus had talked to them about this. He told them this was going to happen. In fact, if you read in the book of Luke, there's one time where he gets a hold of them and he says, let these words sink down into your ears. I mean, I don't know how much more graphic you can get than that. And he's telling them the Son of Man is going to be crucified. I'm going to hand it over to the Gentiles. I'll be crucified, but be of good cheer because I will not stay dead. I will rise again on the third day according to the scriptures, and I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Now, we would have thought they would have been so excited that, that this would have just been a road bump along the way. Yeah, I would have been sad. And why did he have to go through, much, through so much pain? But listen, he's raising again. Let's go to Galilee. Let's, let's meet him there. And yet they're not. What do we find the disciples doing? They're hiding for fear of the Jews. They're, they're running away from Jesus. They're, they're running all over the place. Uh, in fact, on, on the road to Emmaus, you find a couple of disciples. And Jesus shows up on the scene. They're talking to him. They don't even realize it's him. And they're saying, are you a stranger around? Don't you know what's happened? And the worst part of all of this is that it's the third day since this has happened. And Jesus starts to rebuke their unbelief. In fact, most of the time when Jesus shows up on the scene after the, the resurrection, what does he do? He upbraids them. I love that word. That's a great King James word, right? He upbraids them. He rebukes their unbelief. And he says, don't be unbelieving. Believe. Get in faith. Just because you can't see what's going on doesn't mean God's not doing something. Just because it looks like the end, just because it looks like a death has taken place. Don't worry. Don't fret. Don't fear. God is moving. God is working. God is building. God is going to do it. God will take care of it. God is the God who tells the end from the beginning. Hallelujah. See, even the tomb spoke of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You say, how, how could the tomb speak of the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Because remember the words I had you say? That wasn't Jesus' tomb. That was Joseph's tomb. Remember, he laid them in his own tomb. That was not Jesus' tomb. See, Jesus didn't need a tomb here on the earth. Why? He was only going to borrow one for a couple of days. He wasn't going to stay dead. He was speaking. He was saying something to us. I'm not laying here. I'm not staying here. I'm, I'm going to raise again. And I'm here to tell you today, I've been to both sites in Jerusalem. Neither of them have the body of Jesus sitting there. He is alive. He is risen. He is not here. He is raised as he said he would. What does this mean to us? It means we need to believe God when the situation looks dead. 
Even if the stone has been rolled over it and we can't see what God is doing, stay in faith, church. Remember Hebrews 11, 1, the definition of faith says that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Yeah, the world might post a guard. They might say your fate is sealed and post a guard to secure your loss. But church, stay in faith. Let's believe God. His burial calls for faith. So good. So we look at the scripture, we're talking about a wonderful subject. And the subject is really the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And each one of those words have something to say. Let me just review for a few moments. Pastor Luke brought the word death. It shows love. The supreme power of the universe is not an army, it's not an atom bomb, it's not an earthquake, it's not the oceans, it's not the military supreme power. The supreme power of the universe is the love of God. The Bible makes it very clear that love cannot fail. Therefore, it is the supreme power of the universe. And you may feel like no one loves you. You may feel like you're worthless. You may feel like you've failed. You may feel like you're rejected. But the truth is that someone loves you so much that they gave of themselves so that you could have something. Which brings us to number two that Pastor Dan brought, which is fabulous. The burial calls us to remembrance and calls us to faith. And what we do is oftentimes we're, our faith is stopped at what we see, stopped at what is logical, stopped at what we can calculate and figure out. Our faith only goes as far as the natural, but the problem with that is we're looking for supernatural results. And when your faith only goes as far as the natural, you'll only get natural results. I don't know about you, but if I want supernatural results, my faith's gonna go beyond the natural. He's gotta be bigger than what I see. And when it looks like it's all over, when it looks like you've failed, when it looks like you have no talent, when it looks like you don't know how to make it, when you look like the world's gonna fall on you at any moment, it looks like you can't and don't have the ability to do it, you don't have the money, you don't have the resources, you don't have the education, there's absolutely no way for you to accomplish anything in life. Here's what it's all about. It's you believing God. You put in the natural, he puts in the super, and now you have a supernatural life. But you have to put in the natural. And if you only put in the natural and don't ever believe God for the super, you'll only get natural results. Very important for all of us to see and experience, which brings us to the resurrection. The resurrection cries out something. For every one of us, at least it should, it cries out the word, if you will, and brings us to a place of hope. In other words, the tomb is empty. That wasn't the final say. I have hope for tomorrow because the tomb is empty. And I want you to know something right now. I don't care who you are or what you've faced. I don't care how uneducated you are, or how much you've failed. And I don't care how many times you've been married. I don't care how many times you've screwed up. I don't care if you're the biggest sinner in all of the area. I'm here to tell you something. There's hope for today, there's hope for tomorrow, and there's hope for eternity because the tomb is empty. <laughs> Buddha, and I'm not picking on anybody, Buddha's tomb is still full, probably very full. I don't even know about Mohammed. I don't know anything about that. I'm not here to criticize anybody. But one thing I do know is there's proof that the tomb is empty. And Jesus was seen 
by hundreds afterwards and communicated with. In fact, listen to this, not proof from the Bible, but secular proof. There is more proof that Jesus Christ lived after the resurrection, raised from the dead, than there is proof that Julius Caesar walked on this planet. There's more earthly, worldly proof of Jesus Christ. Things written, documents proclaimed from people who were not Christians, secular truth that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, seen and spotted by hundreds of people than Julius Caesar ever lived. You have no problem in believing Julius Caesar where the church has a problem is believing that Jesus Christ raised from the dead. And if he's raised from the dead, then here's what my question is. Does the Bible not say to every single one of us, all things are possible to him that believes? Is that not the hope for tomorrow? Does that mean when I can't make it, all of a sudden I've got God on my side? I can make it because he makes the difference. Paul writes these words in 2 Corinthians. He says, and when I am weak, then I am strong because God comes in. Will you ever be weak? When you're weak, you are a candidate for God's power. And that's what brings us the hope that we need to have. My friends, it's a living hope in your business, a living hope in your finances. It's a living hope, if you will, in your families, with your children, in your dreams, and your vision. Hope that not only today and tomorrow and next month, next year, but there's a day coming in the hearts of every one of us that are born of the Spirit of God that there's a hope that the eastern sky will split and Jesus is coming to get us. There's a hope. I love the Word of God. Listen to why we have a hope, and it's wonderful in 1 Peter, as Peter writes in the first chapter, verse number 3. I'll just put it up on the overhead for you. Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us. I love the word again. What do you mean again? You know, you, you, begotten us again? In other words, in order to be begotten again, that means I had to be there once before. When was I ever there before? You were there, listen, saints, in Adam before the fall. So God redeems mankind back through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's begotten us again to a dying, failed, no, living hope. A hope that says I have life. I have a future. I don't know how I'm going to make it, but I'm going to make it. My body says I'm not going to make it, but my God says I am going to make it. My age says I'm not going to make it, but my God says I am going to make it. My finances say I'm not going to make it, but my God says I am going to make it. That's a living hope. How did I get it? How did you get it? How did every one of us get it? Listen to this. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Amen. It's a powerful statement. One more little verse for today. In Hebrews, the sixth chapter, verse 18, here you find that the writer is talking about Jesus. And as he's writing this in Hebrews, the sixth chapter, verse 18, he's making a statement about how God confirms his promises to you and I. In other words, when you get a promise, you can stand on the promise. The promise may be different than what you feel. The promise may be different than the natural. Most likely it will be. You don't need a promise for the natural. The natural, you can figure it out. What you need the promises for is that which is not natural. Amen. And hold on to them until they come to pass. If it's a promise of God, that's what he's confirming here. It says, by two immutable things, that's the eternal word of God and the covenant of God. Can't be broken positively. When God said it, that settles it. And he comes along and says, in which is impossible, it is impossible for God to lie. You can lie, I can lie, but God can't lie. It's impossible for God to lie. So when he makes a statement, he makes a statement that we might have strong, that we might be, listen to this, and have strong consolation. In other words, he wants you to be strong. When you start believing God, it's not an overnight magical abracadabra, it's done. You may have to live a lifetime believing God for it, but it will come to pass if it's the will of God. He says, who have fled, and I love these words. 
He says, we have a strong consolation who have fled. You and I ran for refuge to do something. You ever thought about what you ran to God for? To do something. Did you know what it is? Here it is, to lay hold of the hope set before us. In other words, when you get right with God, let me say this to you, God places hope for whatever it is in the future and it's before you and you gotta lay a hold to it. The words lay hold means get a hold of, take for yourself. So the question is, listen, what happens if you don't? In other words, if it's before you and you can take a hold of this hope, but you don't, do you have it? No. Let me give you an illustration of that. Um, 20 bucks. I'm going to give you 20 bucks. $20 is yours. But in order to get it, you have to lay hold of it. If you don't lay hold of it, take it, you don't get it. So if you lay hold of this, you got it. That's what he's saying about hope up there. Yeah. You got it, but if you don't take it, it doesn't do you any good. But it's the one that takes it that has it. And I'm giving you 20 bucks. <laughs> Come in. Wait a minute. Come and take it. You got it. Sorry, he beat you to it. If, if he didn't get up out of the chair, the rest of you didn't get up out of your chair. How many of you got my 20 bucks? He's the only one that got 20 bucks. And now look at the verse again. Pop the verse up. Where's the verse? Where's the verse? He says this. He says, we ran from refuge because we're standing strong because of this hope. And we fled to refuge to hold on to this hope that's set before us. And I like the next verse. Verse number 19 comes along. Listen to this. This hope we have as an anchor of our soul. In other words, the world, hear me, hear me, hear me, hear me. The world is going, has anybody noticed it? The world is going crazy. Has anybody noticed right is wrong and wrong is right? Uh, has anybody noticed the things that they're doing today they never used to do? Am I the only one that sees this world as going down the toilet? And all of a sudden, it says this. He says, it's anchor of my soul, steadfast and sure. Watch these words. Which enters into the presence behind the veil. Behind the presence, behind the veil is where Jesus is. In other words, I have hope to go to God. I have hope to be with God. I have hope to hear from God. So today, three things. I love this. It says three things that are outstanding. The death of that shows an amazing love for you. A burial that calls you to take your faith beyond the natural. <laughs> and a resurrection that brings you to hope for whatever it is you're believing God for. Amen. If God spoke to you today, come on, give the Lord a great big praise. Now let's talk just for a moment. Don't get up, don't leave. You know, when you get up and leave, everybody follows you. We're kind of like little sheep. What, oh, that's it. I've given God 20 minutes. That's enough for this year. <laughs> Stop it. Stop it. Sit down and let's talk. Today, this is a divine appointment for many of you that are in here. A divine appointment. You've had a lot of appointments in your life. You had appointments with doctors and attorneys and painters and plumbers. But today you have an appointment with God. God didn't bring you here just to listen to the message or to sing a song. God brought you here specifically that his love would touch you. His faith would be in you. And his hope would inspire you. Today, many of you that are here need, hear me, hear me, need to get right with God. You're not right with God. In fact, let me tell you the truth. 
if you walked out of this place today and your heart stopped on your way to your car and you died, you'd be in hell. And you can give me all the baloney you want about, oh, I don't believe in hell. Because you don't believe in it doesn't make it real and doesn't make it unreal and doesn't make it go away. It's very real. Very real according to the word of God. Today, you need to make sure and forever that you're right with God because you're here for a reason. Some people say, well, I'm right with God because, uh, uh, you know, I love God. I'm going to go to heaven because I love God. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that you get to go to heaven because you love God? Did you know it's not in the Bible? Some of you said, well, I'm going to go to heaven and I'm right with God because I'm a pretty good person. I'm, I'm pretty good. Great. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that'll get you to heaven because you're pretty good? Some of you say, well, I'm pretty nice. I'm going to make it to heaven because I'm pretty nice. Did you know nowhere in the Bible does it say that? Don't you think that if God wanted to get you to heaven, he would tell you how to get to heaven? Or, or do, you, do you think he just says, well, I'll leave it up to you. Whatever you decide will get you to heaven. I mean, there's some pretty crazy things out there. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man goes to the Father except by me. In other words, you can't get to the Father, you can't get to heaven my way or your way. Can't get to heaven, you know, some well-meaning church committee's way. If you're going to get to heaven, you're going to have to get to heaven his way. And he tells us exactly in the scripture how to get to heaven, because you know why you need to know this? Because you do not want to go to hell, and you know you don't. So let's talk. He tells us how to get to heaven. In John, the third chapter, he said these words, you must be born again. You must be born. I love the word must. You must be born again. Again, Now, when I say the words born again, immediately lots of people turn off because we've been trained by television, media, movies that born again people are idiots, fools, radicals, crazy as can be. But I'm not talking about that. When Jesus makes a statement, you must be born again, did you know that most people that attend American churches don't really know what that means? So let me tell you what it means. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, here's what it means to be born again. Are you listening? Are you listening? Here's what it means to be born again. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, are you listening? It means you have given God all of your heart. You have given God all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. All or nothing. God forgive us in American churches for 250 years. We've watered that down. But it's all or nothing, and I'll prove it to you that it's all or nothing. I'll prove it to you. Listen, last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation, you've heard of it. Jesus himself is speaking, and he says, I'm coming again, and you know he is. And he says, and when I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. That is a rude, crude statement out of the mouth of Jesus. Oh, my goodness. Vomit me? What did he just really say? Here's what he just really said. People who call themselves Christians that are lukewarm are not real Christians at all, and they're going to get vomited from the mouth of Jesus when he comes back. Oh, my goodness. Well, let me define lukewarm for you so you can understand this so we're all on the same page, okay? Because this is really important. Listen closely. Lukewarm, a little in, a little out. Lukewarm, a little up, a little down. Lukewarm, a token prayer, occasional church attendance. Lukewarm, you're not against God but you're not wholehearted for God. Lukewarm. God is something in your life. Oh, but he's not everything. That's lukewarm. And by the way, he'll never become something until you 
Make him everything. You say, well, how do I do that? You got to do it his way. Simple as can be. Listen, stop thinking about it just for a moment. Stop, 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 stop. He's the God that created the heavens and the earth, like Pastor Dan was talking about, that speaks, Pastor Luke, that speaks and planets exist. Oh, my goodness. Are you going to tell me that he couldn't make a billion robots that look just like you, act exactly like you? He could get every one of them to worship him, everyone to sing songs and act a certain way. Have you noticed how he doesn't do that? He made you. And he says to you, now the choice is yours. It's your choice to give him all of your heart and to give him all of your life. Nobody else's. Your choice. And he's looking for people that want him. He wants you, but you got to want him too. And that's what this is really all about. People don't want him, hey, this is not for you. But people that want him, this is for you. And you make the right choice to give him all of your heart and give him all of your life. You say, well, Pastor Jim, how do I do that? Let's do it God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. So in a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three, and I'll pop my hands together. Bang! When you hear that sound, bang! Your hand goes up. I'll see your hand go up. And what you're saying by the raising of your hand is I don't want Jesus in my head like most Americans. I want to give him all of my heart and give him all of my life because actually that's what he's all about. He's all after your heart. And you want to give him all of your heart and give him all of your life. That's what this is all about. See, I already know you know who Jesus is or you wouldn't be here today. I already know you know about the resurrection. I already know you know probably a little bit about what we talked about today. Or you wouldn't be here. That does not make you a Christian. Why? The devil knows who he is and he's not a Christian. He's experienced every bit of it. And he's not a Christian. So it's not what you have in your head. Listen to me. Listen, listen. Listen, listen, listen. Look, 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 look at me. It's what you've done with your heart. Have you given him all of your heart? Have you given him all of your life? Free will choice. It's your call, your choice. Today is your day of salvation. You say, Pastor Jim, how do I do this? Well, I'm going to count through and go like well, this. One, two, three. I'll pop my hand. Bang! Your hand goes up. I'll see it. And you can put it right back down. How simple is that? And you're making a statement, a public statement. I want Jesus. I want to go to heaven. I don't want to go to hell. I want to be born again. And I'll see your hand. Because he said, if you confess me before men, I'm a man, I'll see it. Your call, your choice. Who should raise their hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your heart, I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your life, I'm speaking to you. If you're one of those people that are in here and you're just not sure, make sure I'm speaking to you. Today, <laughs> You have a divine appointment with God. Don't miss this appointment. You say, Pastor, if I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. I can't raise my hand. The people I came with will see me. I'll feel funny. The people behind me will see me, Pastor. I can't, I can't raise my hand. Yep, you will feel funny. Get over it. It's better to feel funny for a moment in a safe place like this than to be in hell forever and ever because you care more about what people think instead of what God sees. Come on, nobody's that dumb. But the devil thinks you are, and he's trying to talk you out of it right now. Are you going to listen to him? Today is your day of salvation. I'm counting to three. I've done my job. Get ready to put your hands up all across this auditorium and in the family room, out in the foyer. If you're watching by television in the foyer, if you're down at the Love Rock Cafe, put the burrito down. I'm here to tell you, this is you can get your hand up and get right with God. Today, all across this campus, this is your time. Are you ready? Here it is. One, two, three. 
see. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. One, two, three, four. Let me count them. Don't clap. Don't clap. Don't clap. Don't clap. Don't count. I'm, I'm fishing. I'm fishing. You're throwing rocks in the water when you clap. Hold on. Everybody, everybody. Let me count your hands again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixty. Thank you. We're up 16, 17, 18. Look at this. 19, 20, 21, 22. Wave at me a little bit with those hands. 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34. Thank you. 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, 60, 61. This is pretty good for a preacher to count like this, isn't it? Uh, 61, 62, 63, 64, 65, 66. Thank you, God. You will put your hand down. You've already done that every every service. 66, 67, 68, 69, 70, 71, 72, 73, 74. My goodness, isn't it good? 74. Where, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait, wait. Where's 75? I'm a greedy. Oh, there you are. Okay. Now give the Lord a great big praise. <laughs> isn't God good? Now look. Here's what I want you to do. All 75 of you, I want you to get all your coat, purse, sweater, Bible friend. If Jesus can walk a beaten, bloody mess for you, you can walk a safe aisle for him. And I want you to get your stuff. Bring a friend if you need a friend. Check with your friend next to you. Make sure if they need to come, you'll go with them and tell them that. And meet me right here in front. No one leave during this period of time. Come on, you can give God more than an hour. No one leave during this period of time. And all 75 of you, come out of that family room, come out of this family room, come out of the foyer, wherever you're at. I want just all to stand. We're going to welcome you. You get down here. Let's pray together. Come on down here. Come on. Come, 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 come. Amazing love, how can it be? You my king would die for me. Come on home. Amazing come on home. my joy to honor you. Amazing Come love, on home. how can it be? You might give Oh, they're coming. Give them a hand as they come. Me. Easter 2014. My joy on you in all I do. Oh, they're still coming. Give them a hand as they come. Come on, there's time. We're waiting for you. Come on home. They're still coming. They're still coming. They're still coming. They're still coming. In all I do. God good. There's like a hundred of you up here. All of you in front, thank God you've come. This is the greatest day of your life. There's no greater day than this day. You'll find that out someday. You may not know it yet. But I want you to look, I want you to look to your left. See this guy waving at me? Give wave, big wave, big wave, big wave. That's, that's Pastor Joel. Good guy, cool guy, no weird stuff goes on, I promise you. He's going to do three things. Let me tell you what the three things are so that you won't be afraid. Three things, here they are. Number one, he's going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You need to invite Jesus into your heart. You know, he doesn't come into your heart because you need him. He went to the cross and died for you because you need him. Now he's a gentleman and you need to invite him in. He doesn't go or he's not invited. That's what's so interesting about his character, okay? So a legion of prayer to invite him in. Secondly, you're going to be born again, but now what are you going to do? What does God want from you? He'll give you some free, I love the free word. In, we're in San Bernardino. The F word in this church is free. And uh, we... we uh, <laughs> so we'll, we'll give you free some literature to take home and read about what to do next, you know, and we want to help you in that next step. Third thing is what we want to do is we want to introduce you to a program we have so you don't fall through the cracks. 
In other words, we have a spiritual personal training program, a friend. We give friends away here that will meet you before church service, pray for you during the week until you get strong so that you can help somebody else. Is that okay? So it only takes a few moments of your time. You'll come right back out. The people you came with, they'll wait for you. Is that okay? Will you wait for them? Oh, they said no. What kind of friends have you got? No, they, they, they'll wait for you. It only takes a few moments. Make a left turn and follow Pastor Joel right over this way. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow, you repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me. And then he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins. That I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth, that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.